Battle of Utah Springs are actually featured as an article in the very first War Games magazine I ever bought. It's a practical war game of summer 1988. It's still a really good magazine, lots of really good content to it, but the one article uh, we'll see here was Redcoats and Rebels, all about the Battle of Utah Springs, written by Peter Helm, who at the time ran Redoubt Miniatures. It's a four page article with plenty of colour for the time, describing his War Games refight of Utah Springs on the tabletop with some, some maps showing how his game went, which are a little different to the historical situation, uh, and photos of, of his collection at the time, which was uh, Rafam, I think, mostly. Uh, choice in those days being a little bit more limited uh, around the American War of Independence. It's a good write-up um, and still, still one that's quite a good read today. There was another article uh, in Practical Wargamer about nine years later by Chris Cope, uh, one of a series of three articles about battles in the South. Uh, so this one covered the battle with some rather nice uh, artwork showing where the units were, but not differing greatly in its uh, description of the battle from the previous. There aren't many books specifically addressing the Battle of Utah Springs. It's often a bit of an afterthought in more general histories. But this one came out fairly recently uh, and really covers the battle well. Um, it's got quite a good level of detail to it. It's got a lot of background on the commanders who were present on the day. Uh, some interesting stuff about the geology of the area uh, and some really helpful battlefield maps showing the topography, which I find really helpful. There's uh, also a good podcast from uh, Dispatches, which is the podcast of the Journal of the American Revolution. Uh, and that particular episode, uh, shown on screen, covers mapping of the battlefield and better understanding of the road network, which we will come on to later in this presentation. Utah Springs is really the culmination of a whole series of, of campaigns uh, in the southern colonies throughout the War of Independence. From some minor actions in the early years, uh, the first major campaign being the uh, operations against Savannah in 1779, and then the, uh, the better known campaigns of Cornwallis and Green through 1780, culminating at Guildford Courthouse. As we come towards the campaign leading to Utah Springs, Cornwallis has decided to abandon the Carolinas uh, and head up towards Virginia in the actions eventually leading up to, to Yorktown and his surrender. Uh, and Green adopted not to pursue him there, but to turn further south and deal with the remaining British forces um, at that time under the command of Lord Rawdon. So in the spring of 1781, Green turned back into South Carolina, heading for the main British camp at Camden, which was held by Rawdon and his main force. Just before reaching Camden, Green's encamped at Hobkirk's Hill, just to the north, where he was counterattacked by Rawdon with a smaller force. Things didn't go well for Green, and he was fairly comprehensively defeated and forced to abandon his attack on Rawdon and pull back. Green now turned west, heading for the fort at 96, held by loyalists commanded by John Harris Kruger. Green arrived in May and began to besiege the various fortifications around 96. The siege went on for some time with Green not really having the, the weight of forces or even really the time to adequately pursue the siege. While the siege was going on, Rawdon received reinforcements and marched with a relieving column. Arriving in June, 
Green was forced to abandon the siege and pull back. The British, however, did accept that 96 was untenable as a long-term outpost and did abandon it after the relief. They pulled back close to the centre of South Carolina, now under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Stewart, as Rawdon had been forced to abandon his command due to illness. And Green spent the long, hot months of the summer of 1781 holding his position in the hills of the High Santee. As the summer drew to a close, Green finally made his move, advancing on Stuart's encampment at Utah Springs and precipitating a battle. Stuart was caught off guard, not realising that Green was anywhere near him, and the battle actually started with a foraging party of British and provincial troops being overrun whilst digging sweet potatoes. The battle was a particularly bloody one, a very unpleasant way for actions to draw to a close in the in the war. Uh, and though Stuart was left in command of the ground, he was compelled to fall back on Charleston. And this effectively ended British control of the Carolinas and Georgia. So Utah Springs is a really interesting battle, not only because it's another one of those slightly unexpected tactical victories for an outnumbered British army, but also because after Utah Springs, it was very clearly a question of when the British would accept their defeat in the war, not if. Colonel Stewart's British Army had a number of really high quality veteran units. You can see some of these commanded by Major Stewart, 2nd Battalion of the 84th, the 63rd and the 64th. Although small in numbers, they were veteran troops. Also experienced and of high quality was the Flank Company Battalion, built of light infantry and grenadiers under Major Marchbanks. The third foot were present in strength, having recently arrived in America, although whether their quality was as high as their colleagues is debatable. Supplementing these, were some loyalist troops. These are effectively brigaded under uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kruger. Uh, we can see Delance's unit from New York, some New Jersey volunteers, New York volunteers, and some higher quality provincial light infantry. Finally, we have Major Coffin's loyalist dragoons, who appear to be mounted elements of the New York volunteers. Unit strengths are a bit of a fudge, as is often the case when we assemble War Games armies. Uh, whilst there is information about the strength of both armies on the day, uh, certainly the British figures um, are those from before the large foraging party was ambushed, so actual unit strength is likely to be lower than the figures quoted. On the other hand, the Americans may also have had stragglers, um, so it's always very difficult to tell. Um, so I've taken the figures as indicative of the relative unit sizes. Um, done the best with them, uh, accepting there's only some inaccuracy there. General Green's army was his usual polyglot force. Of his continental troops, those from Maryland and Virginia were highly experienced and of good quality. His brigade of North Carolina continentals was more recently raised. In fact, they'd only managed to find manpower by impressing into service former militia troops. So we have to rate their qualities being a little lower. Helping out on the flanks were the experienced troops of Kirkwood and Lee. Lee providing a legion that included cavalry as well as light infantry. And in reserve were the light dragoons of Lieutenant Colonel William Washington. These were composed of elements of a number of different Continental Light Dragoon regiments. As well as the Continentals, Green had a fairly large quantity of militia from the Carolinas, 
uh, of these, those commanded by Pickens and Marion, obviously benefited from the strong leadership of those colonels. Um, there's really less known about uh, de Malmedy's quality as a militia commander. Finally, we have some state troops from South Carolina. South Carolina really failed to reform a continental line, so relied quite heavily on its state troops, and the majority of these seem to be light dragoon units. Although I've assumed for this battle, at least some of those were fighting dismounted, particularly given the terrain they were, they were attacking on the British flank. On the miniature battlefield, I took one of the many available maps uh, and overlaid a rectangle scaled to the size of my war games table. I then played about with this in different configurations until I settled on one that really fitted in the maximum amount of interesting terrain and the anticipated troops that we need to fit on the table. Fortunately with Utah Springs you haven't got to worry too much about the extra flanks. Uh, on the right are you bounded by the river? for the British uh, and on their left there's a ravine that really stops them being outflanked too far. With the orientation sorted out you can then start drawing a rough map of what the war games table is going to look like, popping in the roads and the waterways. The road's quite interesting, this road to roach is the one that goes off to to the left here um, is a bit debatable. Um, it's not the way it's shown on a lot of maps of the battlefield, but some of that more recent research sort of convinces me that that's where it should be, not going off diagonally where it's marked here on these maps. It doesn't really fit with the description of the battle uh, and how the British troops were deployed along the road. With the basic features in place, we can then think about the uh, topography of the ground. There aren't many significant hills on this battlefield, there's no huge contours. But it's good to have a bit of rise and fall on the terrain. It's some areas of dead space, so even the small contours are marked in. And they're a little bit more in scale with the figures than they are with the ground scale. With the preamble out of the way, let's go on with actually fighting a war game. I'll mostly let the pictures speak for themselves. The rules I've used for the game are available on my blog. Um, they're the Bloody Backs rules, version 7, something I've been working on for a very long time. Um, they're a constant work in progress rather than a finished product, so uh, Please don't ask me if they'll ever be published, because I really don't think they will. Um, I'm just trying a few tweaks um, at the moment in this game um, around how hits are converted into disruption and kills. So there's a few things that are definitely incomplete right now. Uh, part of the changes I'm making are to stop using the exact number of figures in a model to represent its ongoing strength in the game. So rather than removing figures um, there's a little countdown and I'm using these dice markers to show it. So the red dice shows number of disruption, one to three, and the other dice show the strength. The first is whole groups of six figures uh, and then the second dice is for odd numbers of figures. So you can see here, see here um, a 35 figure unit with some disruption on it. 
So there we have it. Just like the real battle, a complete slugfest. Slightly different outcome. But you can see why it's such a hard fight. The terrain on each flank channels any attack. The Americans can't make use of their overwhelming superiority in cavalry. The units are of fairly high quality. So everyone just carries on fighting, wearing each other down. We see massive attrition until eventually units break and just can't carry on any longer. In this case, it was the British, but actually it was a really close fight. The Americans could have collapsed a number of times themselves, but they just hung in long enough until it was inevitable the British just couldn't fight on any longer. Just like Burgoyne at Saratoga, Stuart's forced to surrender and effectively the war draws to its conclusion. Thanks for watching. Do check out my Facebook page or my blog for updates on my various wargaming projects. Hopefully there'll be more videos soon.